Hey, and welcome to the show. Uh, if you don't know what I do, um, I right now I am reading from the book you see on your screen, uh, Macroeconomics, from I believe is a modern monetary theory standpoint. And so far from what I've looked up as far as like events happened and who basically wrote about it happening before it happened were MMTers, or at least people who know more about uh, fi finances than the uh, consultants out there, the hedge fund, the hedge funders, basically hedge, fund, hedge funds and stuff of that nature are basically fixed income uh, type of uh, funds. So either way, the people who, are, who run those are going to make money either way because uh, it's fees and such. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so right now I'm on chapter 17, uh, unemployment and inflation. There's been a lot of talk about inflation recently in regards to money and stuff of that nature, and uh, that's actually uh, part of the uh, chapter here, so I'll be going over inflation here momentarily. But anyway, 17.1, uh, 7 introduction. In this chapter, we will review the concept of inflation and discuss various uh, approaches that seek to explain it. Uh, an inflationary process can be understood within a general framework whereby different climates of, diff of real GDP and national income struggle to assert their uh, aspirations. In this sense, we cast an inflation within the general distribution struggle or conflict that is a characteristic of, characteristic, characteristic of capitalist economies between workers seeking to maintain or achieve a higher wage and firms seeking to maintain or raise their profit margin. We will di differentiate... Di <laughs> and differentiate there we go, between one cost push and demand pull as initiating uh, initiating causes of inflationary process, pressure uh, process excuse me the first type has been termed cost pu uh, cost push inflation because it originates from the cost of productive uh, increasing and pushing up the price level the second type is ter termed demand pull because excess nominal demand relative to uh, output capacity initially pushes up the price level. We then consider the classical quantity theory of money in more detail. This model asserts that there is a di direct relationship between money supply growth and inflation, such that inflationary process is always due to the central bank allowing the, this growth rate to be excessive. The quantity theory is a central element of the quantity. Yeah, quant, quantity theory is a central element of uh, monetarism, which we discuss later in this chapter. We show that the basis of the theory is accounting identity. However, the theory fails in its attempt to demonstrate causality. In chapter eighteen. Uh, we will use the ideas uh, presented here to consider the major theoretical and policy debates within macroeconomics with respect to inflation. 17.2. What is inflation? There are mis misconceptions as to what price inflation actually is. An increase in prices is necessary, is necessary but not so sufficient, uh, in, uh, yeah, wait, sufficient uh, condition for an inflationary process to unfold. Thus, a negotiated pay increase for workers or firms increases their price to try to increase profit uh, or a rise in local pr uh, prices of imported goods following uh, depreciation of the exchange rate may or may not uh, initiate an inflationary process. Uh, it looks like the meaning of it. Uh, inflation is the continuous rise in the price level, so the price level has to be uh, to be rising for a number of time periods. Uh, One-off price rises not in the inflationary episode. If the price level rises by ten percent every month, for example, then we would be then we would be observing an inflationary 
episode. In this case, the inflationary inflationary rate would be considered stable with the price level rising rising at a uh, con constant ri rate per period. If the price level was rising by 10% in each month, then 11% in each month, two, then 12%, then 12 in months three, and so on. Then we would be observing an accelerated inflation rate. Extreme cases of accelerating uh, inflation are referred to as hyperinflation. There have been three, or no, sorry, there have been few instances of this problem in, in record, recorded history, but the uh, Weimar Republic in 1920s, Germany, and Zimbabwe at the beginning of the 21st century are notable examples. They were marked by dramatic contraction of the supply potential of the respective economies prior to the hyperinflation. This will be in, uh, in Chapter 21, uh, or more of this anyways. Um, alternatively, if the price level was rising by 10% in month, in month one, 9% in month two, and so on, then the rate of inflation is failing or decelerating. If the price level starts to fall, then the growth of the price level is negative, and this would be a deflationary episode. There's a reminder box, and you may wish to, rep to refresh your understanding of the measurement of the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, and the, uh, and the computation of the inflation rate by referring back to Chapter 4 to Section 4.8. We can define a normal price level as being the price, prices that, that firms are willing to charge when they are operating at normal capacity and earning a profit, uh, profit rate that satisfies, that satisfies their uh, strategic aspirations. Um, see the discussion of markup price in Chapter 16. However, the economic cycle fluctuates around these normal rates of capacity utilization and, firm, and firms not only adjust to the flux and uncertainty of aggregate demand for adjusted output, but in, in some cases will vary prices. This is particularly the case during a recession. When there are very depressed levels of activity, firms might offer discounts in order to increase sales, enhance capacity utilization. Thus, they temporarily suppress their profit margins in order to try to raise their respective market shares when overall demand is falling. As demand conditions become more favorable, Firms start withdrawing the discounts and prices return to those levels that offer the desired rate of return at normal rates at capacity utilization. We do not consider these cyclical adjustments in prices to, uh, to constitute inflation. 17.3, this section uh, that's numbered that, uh, inflation as a conflictual process. Conflict theory uh, situates the problem of inflation as being intrinsic to the power re uh, relations between the workers and capital, or class conflict, which are mediated by government within a capitalist system. It brings together social, political, and economic uh, considerations and generalized view of inflation cycle. The this medium uh, by government varies over the course of history, but in more recent times have been biased towards protecting the interest of capital, particularly financial capital at the expense of workers' real wage aspirations. Conflict theory is most uh, most closely identified with inflationary processes in, in initiated by uh, cost push. However, it is important to recognize that an inflationary process, whether initiated by the forces of cost push or demand pull, by definition requires two to tango so that an increase in prices is ongoing. Otherwise, the change in the level of wages or prices is a one-off event. The, na the nature of the power relations between workers and capital is integral to understanding all inflationary processes. In product markets, firms have pri uh, price setting power and set prices by applying a markup to cost. 
firms seek to achieve target profit rates that satisfy their shareholders or owners, and these are expressed by the size of the markup on their unit cost. Unit costs are driven largely by wage cost, productivity movement, and raw material prices. Shifts in any of these determinants can generate cost increases, which price setting firms may pass on by rising prices. On the other hand, the bargaining strength of workers will depend on their capacity to mobilize effectively, which is typically through trade union action. The shift, it, the shift to non-standard employment, which can include zero-hour contracts, and some countries include the UK, along with reduced rates of unionization in many developed countries, that has, has reduced the bargaining power of the union movement. In many instances, this has been reinforced by anti-union legislation. When employers are dealing with workers in, uh, individually, they have more power than when they are dealing with a single bargaining unit or trade union, which represents all workers in their workplace. This is supposed to. Uh, thus, firms and trade unions are some degree of market power, that is, they can influence prices and wage outcomes. They are both assumed to target an income share and use their capacity to influence nominal prices and wages in order to extract the target share. In each period, the economy produces a given output or real GDP, which is shared between the groups within the, with uh, the distributional claims in the form of wages, profits, rents, interest, taxes, and so on. In the initial discussion be below, we assume a way that the other income climates uh, claimants and con and concentrate and wait uh, and concentrate on the split between wages and profits. Later, we will introduce a change in exogenous uh, claim in the form of a rise in the price of raw materials. Uh, if the desire output shares of the workers and firms are co constant with the available output produced, uh, there then there is an uh, is no incompatible yeah incompatibility, and there will be no inflationary pressures. The available output would be uh, distributed each period of prevailing levels of nominal wage. Uh, wage and profits which satisfy the respective climates. However, if the distributional claims are incompatible, then the, the agreed groups would seek uh, redress by seeking wage increases or uh, labor and or impose price increases uh, firm. Uh, one is labor, one is the firm side of it. We continue this analysis in the next section which is cost push inflation. There can be a long line of authors, including uh, Michael uh, Kaliki, a Marxist, who have uh, identified inflation as emerging as a result of distributional struggle over the available real income. The dynamic that, the, yeah, the dynamic that drives a cost push inflation is seen to arise from the um, underlying social relations in the Economy. This theory of inflation recognizes that the two sides of the labor markets are likely to have conflicting aims and seek to fulfill those aims by imposing cost on the other party. The capacity of workers to realize normal wage gains is considered to be pro-cyclical. That is, when the Econo the economy is operating at high pressure or high levels of capacity utilization. Workers are more able to secure money wage gains. This is especially the case uh, if they are organized into coherent trade unions, which function as a counter available uh, wait, counter veiling uh, <laughs> force to the power of employers. For example, reducing or reductions uh, in Marxist reserve army of un unemployment as the, ec the economy approaches full employment 
gives workers more bargaining power. Trade unions are more likely to uh, de demand higher money wages. Firms may fear prolonged strikes, which will damage them at a time when profit profits are high. To protect these market share, they are more likely to un to under these uh unlike sorry more likely under these circumstances to concede to the workers' demands, knowing that they can in turn use their price setting power to defend their profits by increasing prices. That is a uh, re that is restore the previous markup. This can be described as a battle of the uh, markups. At the point uh, there is no right. At that point, there is no inflation. Just one off increase in money money wages and prices, and no change to the distributions uh, distribution of national income between worker uh, uh, between wages and profits. An inflationary process is uh, instigated and perpetuated if the sum of the distributional uh, claims expressed in normal term man, uh, terms man, money wage demands and markups remain greater than the available output measure at uh, current prices and neither bargaining party now the bargaining party is prepared to concede to the other by ceasing to pursue higher nominal income. And with that said, I will be right back. Hey, welcome back to the show. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to like, don't forget to share, don't forget to comment, and don't forget to visit realprogressives.org. Here, the concepts of real wage and or real profit margin res resistance become relevant. A wage price spiral begins with workers pushing for higher wages or real wages, whereas a price wa wage spiral refers to a dynamic when or where firms uh, initiate the, bar the, the bargaining war by trying to push up their real profit or margins. <clears throat> Pardon me. In a high-pressure economy, firms may also initiate an inflationary process by trying to increase their profit margins. Workers may attempt to maintain their previous real wage and will thus respond to the higher price level by seeking an increase in nominal wages. If their bargaining power is strong, which from the firm's perspective is usually measured in terms of how much damage the workers can inflict on output and hence profits uh, via in, uh, Hertz, pro yeah, no, hence profits in, in the industrial action, when they are likely to su be successful, if not the if not, they may have to accept the real wage cut imposed on them by the higher prices, which implies that their nominal wages have a reduced capacity to purchasing goods and services. However, if firms are not willing to absorb the, the uh, squeeze on their profits following the money wage increase, then they will raise prices again and the beginnings of a wage price spiral occur. If this process continues, then the ca uh, cost push inflation is the result. The wage price sp uh, spiral could develop into a wage wage price uh, spiral if, yeah, if one section of the workforce seeks to restore relativities uh, yeah, relativities after another group of workers succeeds in their normal wage demands. The role of government is also implicated. While in while it is the distributional conflict which initiates the inflationary spiral, government policy has to be compliant for the non uh, for the nascent inflation to persist. Business firms will typically access access credit, for example, overdrafts to finance the working uh, capital needs in advance of real realization of revenue via sales. In, inflationary, in the inflationary spiral, as workers seek higher nominal wages, 
uh, wage, yeah, wages firms uh, will judge whether the cost of industrial action in the form of lost outcome and uh, sorry, output and sales are higher than the cost of accessing credit to fund the higher wage wages bill. Typically, the latter option will be cheaper. If credit conditions become tighter and thus loans become more expensive, then firms will be less able to pay on real wages with the consequence, uh, uh, yeah, consequence negative impact on consumption spending. Firms will also be less willing to in invest in new projects given that the cost of funds is higher. As, consequence, uh, as a consequence of net monetary policy becomes tighter, then there will be some point where the output growth declines and the workers who are in weaker mar uh, bargaining positions are laid off. The rising unemployment in turn eventually discourages the, the workers from continuing to pursue their demand for wage increases and in time the inflationary process will be choked off. Cost push theory, thus hypothesis, uh, a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. The alternative policy stance is for the central bank to accumulate, I'm sorry, to accommodate the inflationary struggle by leaving its monetary there we go, policy settings, interest rates unchanged. This accommodation would be likely to likely see the fiscal authorities maintain existing tax rates and spending growth. The commercial banks would continue to extend loans and in the process create deposits in the accounts of its business clients. The central bank would then ensure that there were sufficient reserves in the banking system to maintain stability in the payment system. The nominal wage price spiral would thus fuel the demand for more loans with little constraint. There are also strong alignments between the cost push theory of inflation and the Hyman misuse financial stability notion, uh, which would be in chapter 26, coming up here in a couple of couple of days, really, as far as the part goes. Um, let's see, where was I at? Uh, when the economic activity is stronger, or sorry, both theories consider that the hype, the behavioral dynamics change across the economic cycle. When economic activity is strong, the banks are more willing to extend credit to those who previously had been considered to be marginal borrowers and are, not, are now seen to be more creditworthy because e economic conditions have improved. Equally, firms will be more willing to pass on national or nominal wage demands because uh, because it becomes sorry, the uh, pages here. Um, and let's see. Wait, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Got lost there for a second. Uh, varies over the course of history, but in more, wait a minute. Am I? No. There we go. Becomes. There we go. <laughs> Hard to find labor and the cost of an industrial disputes uh, in terms of lost sales and profits are high. Workers also uh, have more uh, bargaining power due to the uh, buoyant conditions. At low levels of economic activity, uh, follow sales and uh, falling sales and rising unemployment uh, mitigate or mitigate. I'm sorry, uh, militate against both profit push and wage demands. Also, loan delinquencies rates tend to be higher, and banks become more conservative in their lending practices. Another example of the cost push pressure might come from an increase in the price of a significant imported uh, a significant, uh, in, of a significant imported raw materials such as oil. We all examine the dynamics uh, in the next section. Keynes also suggested that inflation could arise due to cost uh, push factors. Uh, also called uh, sellers or infl uh, sellers inflation. Within the Keynesian tradition, ABBA learners econ economics of employment or in uh, in uh, 51 uh, has a coherent discussion of how 
distributional uh, struggle may lead to a wage price spiral and generalized inflation as each party seeks to defend their income. Learners showed that the dynamic for the real wage price, I'm sorry, for this wage price, not real wage, uh, this wage price spiral could also result from the capital seeking to expand its share of income by pushing up the market, the markup on unit cost. Such a strategy could only be successful if workers concede the real wage cut implied by the higher prices. Firms would be more likely to attempt to strategy exempt. I'm sorry, attempt the strategy when cons, uh, wait when they per perceive the uh, bargaining. Uh, power of workers and to the weak uh, to be weak, that is when the unemployment rate was higher and their perceived the bargaining weight was higher. In the, this way, Lerner recognized that high inflation and high unemployment could coexist and thus identify the phenomenon that subsequently became known as stagflation. From material price increases. Until now, we have been concentrating on workers per, uh, per, pursuing nominal wage increases in order to gain higher real wages uh, and our, for our firms pushing profits margin up to gain a greater profit share of income as the main drivers of an inflationary process. However, uh, raw material price shocks can also trigger cost push inflation. These cost shocks may be imported. Uh, for example, an oil-dependent nation might face higher energy prices if world economic uh, world oil prices rise. Or domestically sourced, for example, a nation may experience a drought which increases the cost of food crops and impacts on all food processes in the uh, processing industry. Here's the try it yourself section. Let us consider the example of a situation where there is a price rise for an essential imported resource. The imported resource price shock amount to a loss of real income for the nation in the question, in the question, in question. Thus there is less real income to distribute to domestic climates. The question then is who bear this loss? With less real income being available for uh, distribution domestically, the reaction of the climates are crucial to the way in which the economy responds to the higher higher costs of imports. The loss has to be shared or borne by some or by one of the climates or the other. What do you think are the strategies available to various constant uh, con uh, con uh, contestant uh, climates? which do you think are most likely to be effective? Continuing on, if in response to the fall in their profit margin markups, uh, domestic firm firms pass on the raw material and cost increases in the form of higher prices, then workers would endure a cut in their real wages. If workers resist this erosion of their real wages and push for higher nominal wage growth, then firms can either ex accept the squeeze on their profit margins or resist. The government can employ a number of strategies that when faced with this dynamic, it can maintain the existing uh, nominal demand growth, which would be very likely to reinforce the spiral. Alternatively, it can use a combination of st strategies to discipline the deflationary process uh, deflation process, excuse me, including the tightening of fiscal and monetary policy to create an unemployment or the Nehru strategy. <clears throat> uh, the development of consensual, uh, consensual? Uh, yes, so consensual incomes policy and or the, uh, the imposition of wage uh, price uh, guidelines without consensus uh, Ultimately, if the climate of real uh, economic, um, oh, sorry, real income continue to try to pass on the raw material price rise to each other, uh, then it is likely that constant contradictory uh, 
yeah, contradictory government policy will be introduced and unemployment will rise. A better strategy would be to either change production process in order to reduce the use of the expensive imported resources or to find a domestic alternative. Uh, this section is called Conflict Theory of Inflation and Inflationary Biases. A series of articles in the journal Marxism Today in 1974 illustrated the prop proposition that inflation was the result of distributional conflict between workers and capital. These, art these articles were written within re references to the early 1970s when inflation rate rose in many Western economies. One article by Pat Devine stated that the inflation process was a structural construct, construct embedded in the um, uh, intrinsic capital-labor conflict. He argued that the increased bargaining power of workers that accompanied the long period of full employment in the post-Second World War period and the declining productivity growth in the early 1970s imparted a structural bias towards inflation, which was manifested in the inflation bre breakout in the mid-1970s that ended the Golden Age. He further claimed that the pro prolonged growth of money wages was unprecedented in the history of capitalism. Uh, uh, this was divine in 74. Capitalists increased prices to maintain profitability and thus countered the attempt to raise real wages. Large um, allegopilistic firms with price settings uh, setting power engage in non-price comp competition. For example, Product quality. These firms, however, were uh, interdependent because they mark uh, the market share. Their market shares were sensitive to their pricing strategies. When a firm was faced with nominal wage demands, its management knew that this is this is that its rival would face similar pressure, and the and that their competitive position would not depend on the absolute price level, while the Government continued to ensure that effective demand was sufficient to maintain full employment. On the other hand, a firm could lose market share if it increases increased uh, prices, while other firms maintained low prices. As a result, firms had little incentive to resist the wage demands of their workers and strong incentives to protect their pro profits by passing on the demands in the form of higher prices. The structural depiction of inflation as being embedded in the class dynamics of capital and labor, both of which have increased capacity to set prices and defend their real shares of income, impl implicates Keynesian-style approach to full employment. There was also an international component to the structural theory, and it was argued that the Bretton Woods system, or, uh, it was in Chapter 9, imported deflationary forces on economies that were experiencing strong domestic de demand growth. As the national income rose and imports increased, central banks were oblig obliged to tighten monetary policy to maintain the agreed exchange rate parity and the constraints on monetary growth acted to choke off in, uh, in in compatible, was, uh, incompatible claims on the available income. With that said, I will be right back. Stay tuned. Again, subscribe, comment, like, share, and hit that bell. And welcome back. We are still on Chapter 17, Unemployment and Inflation. Uh, however, when the Bretton Woods system of converted uh, convertible cu currencies and fixed exchange rates collapsed in 1971, the structural biases towards inflation came to the one came to the fore, came to the fore with floating exchange rates. Uh, I guess this, the next one is a I guess quote it doesn't have quotations to it. So there you go. Floating exchange rate rates have been used as an additional weapon available to the state. Given domestic inflation, floating rates provide a degree of flexibility in dealing with the res resultant 
measure on the external payments position. However, if a float uh, is to be effective in stabilizing a payment imbalance, it is likely to involve, or, uh, involve lower real incomes at home. If a reduction in real wages or other rate of growth is not uh, a, a adjacent or somewhat, and there will be then be additional pressure by for higher money wages, and if this cannot be contained, the state of inflation will increase, and there will be further depreciation. The structuralist view also noted that the mid-1970s crisis, which marked the end of the Keynesian period, was not only marked by rising inflation, but also by ongoing profit squeeze due to declining productivity growth and increased external comp uh, competition for market share. The profit squeeze led to firms reducing their rate of investment, which reduced aggregate demand growth, which combined with harsh contractions in monetary and fiscal policy created the stagflation that bedeviled the world in the second half of the 1970s. Okay, so next page. Uh, page 260. Anyways, the resolution uh, to be a uh, structural bias proposed by econ economists depended depended on their ideological persu persuasion. On the one hand, uh, one identified themselves as Keynesian pr proposed income policy, which would which we share explore the more detailed latter in this chapter as a way of mediating the distributional struggle and achieving nominal income claims that were compatible with the available output. On the other hand, the emerging monetarist, uh, monetarist considered the problem to be an abuse of market power by the trade unions, and this motivated demands for policymakers to legislate to reduce the bargaining power of workers. The raising unemployment was also not sub opposed by capital because it was seen as a vehicle to or for undermining the capacity of the trade unions to make wage demands. From the 1970s, the combined weights uh, weights of uh, pers uh, persistently uh, high unemployment and increased uh, policy attacks on trade unions in many advanced nations that reduced the inflation spiral as workers were unable to pursue real wage growth and productivity growth outstripped real wages growth. As a result, there was a substantial uh, redistribution of income towards profits during this period. The rise of Thatcherism in the UK and Reaganomics in the USA amplified the increasing de de uh, dominance of the uh, monetarist view of the 1980s. Now, the section that we're going to go into is called Demand Pull Inflation. While economists distinguish between cost push and, uh, cost push and demand pull inflation, the uh, demarcation between the two types of inflation is not as clear cut as one might think. Demand pull inflation refers to the situation where prices start accelerating continuously because nominal aggregate demand growth outstrips the capacity of the economy to respond by the expanding real output. We have learned from the national account that aggregate demand is always equal to GDP, which is the market value of, a fi of final goods and services pr produced in some period. We, re we represent that uh, that is as the pr product uh, tr total real output or Y and a general price level or P that is a PY. It is clear that if there is growth in nominal expending uh, and sorry, nominal spending, that is GDP that cannot be met by any increase in output or Y, then the, gener the general price level or P has to rise. The dominant view of inflation in the 1960s were based on Keynes' notion of inflation gap, which, which he outlined in his 1940s pamphlet, How to Pay for the War, a radical plan for the Chancellor of the, uh, of the Exchange. In the general theory in, uh, from 36, uh, 1936, that is, Keynes had developed the 
a notion of the effective demand to help understand how an equilibrium uh, corresponds to less than full employment could arise in the monetary economy. He now uh, he now warn, uh, wanted excuse me uh, to show how there would be a transition to a full employment or employed economy during wartime. With the onset of the Second World War, large-scale spending programs were implemented as part of the war effort. Keynes argued that as employment rose, rising household incomes would drive up consumer spending, which would cause inflation to accelerate even if money wage rates were constant. While Keynes' plan was devised in the context of wartime spending that when faced by tight supply constraints, that is, a restricted ability to expand output, the concept of inflationary gap had been generalized to describe situations of excess demand where aggregate demand is growing faster than the aggregate supply capacity can absorb it. Keynes defined the inflationary gap as an excess of planned uh, expenditure over the available output at um, pre-inflation pre -inflation or base prices. The pre-inflation benchmark output was that corresponded to a full utilization of capacity to produce goods and services our inflationary gap would not open. This idea was distilled into the demand pull theory of inflation. Once full employment was reached, then nominal demand growth beyond that level would be inflationary. Thus, inflation would tend to increase when unemployment fell, see chapter 18, for an analysis for the Phillips curve, which we have next, I believe, um, which pos uh, posits this type of relationship. The theory claimed that a, nom a, a nominal demand growth pushes the unemployment rate towards its uh, irre irreductible minimum uh, or frictional um, unemployment. Wage and price inflation would start to rise. In other words, an inflationary gap would be, would be created by the emergence of excess aggregate demand. There are several factors present in the real world that attenuate these demand effects on the inflation rate. First, firms incur extensive costs when they change prices, which leads to a catalog or menu approach. Whereby firms will forecast their expect expected costs over some future period and set prices according to their desired return. They then signal those prices in their catalogs and advertising to consumers and stand ready to supply whatever is demanded at that price, up to exhaustion of capacity. In other words, they do not frequently alter their prices to reflect change, changing demand conditions. Only periodically with firms typically re revise their price catalogs. Second, trust and reliability are important in economic transactions. For example, firms seek to build relationships with their customers that, were, that, that will ensue product loyalty. In this context, firms will not wish to vary prices after they have been communicated to consumers. Third, firms also resist cutting prices when the demand falls because they want to avoid so-called adverse uh, selection problems whereby they gain reputation only as a bargaining uh, bargain price supplier. Firms value repeat sales and thus, uh, thus want uh, to foster consumer uh, good, uh, goodwill. Circumstances change somewhat when the economic approaches uh, full productive capacity. Then the mix between output growth and prices rises be becomes more likely to be biased towards price rise depending on the bottlenecks in, in specific areas of productive activity. As uh, uh, at full capacity, GDP can, can only grow via inflation, that is, nominal value increase only. At this point, the inflationary gap is breached. 
when the U.S. government pr prosecuted the Vietnam uh, pros prosecuted the Vietnam War effort in the 1960s, the inflation rate began to rise in the late 1960s and early 70s. The demand pulled pressures of the spending associated with the war effort, uh, combined with, stand, with with sharp rise in oil prices following the formation of the organized uh, petroleum export uh, countries uh, cartel, otherwise known as OPEC. OPEC's oil prices quadrupled in 1973 and generated huge cost shocks to oil-dependent economies such as the U.S. and Japan. Cost push and demand pull inflation a summary. Cost push in, uh, inflation requires a certain aggregate demand conditions for it to be sustained in this regard. It is hard to differentiate uh, differentiate differentiate between an inflationary process which was initiated from supply side pressures from one that had that, from one that was initiated by demand wide pressures for example an import uh, imported raw material shock means that a national nation's real income that is available for distribution on to domestic climates is lower this will, this will not be inflationary unless it triggers an ongoing distributional conflict as domestic climates or workers and capital try to pass on the real loss to each other. However, the conflict needs oxygen in the form of ongoing economic activity in sections uh, sectors where the spiral is robust. In that sense, the conditions that will lead to an accelerating inflation a high level, high levels of economic activity, will also sustain an inflationary spiral emanating from demand side. Seventeen point four, the quantity theory of money, as we saw in chapter eleven, the classical theory of employment is based on the view that the real variables in the economic the economy, output, productivity, real wages, and employment are determined by the equilibrium outcome in the labor market. <clears throat> by way of summary, the real wage determined exclusively by labor demand and labor supply, which also determined the real level of economic activity at any point in time. Say's law, which follows from the loanable fund doctrine, or see chapter 11 also, is then invoked to assume away any problems in matching aggregate demand with the, with the supply of goods and services. Under this doctrine, saving and investment will investment will always be brought into balance by movements in the interest rates, which is construed as being the price of today's consume, consumption relative to and future consumption. The, the, thus, two relative prices, the real wage and the labor market and the real interest rate in the, lo in the loans market, ensure that full employment occurs with zero involuntary unemployment. This separation between the explanation for the, uh, de the determination of the real economic output and the theory of general price level uh, refers to as the classical uh, it sound wrong, but uh, dictonomy. Yeah, hold on, sorry guys. Anyways, uh, dictonomy. Uh, which is spelled D I C H O T O M L Y, just so you know. Uh, for uh, uh, obvious reasons, the classical, uh, the latter classical uh, econ ec economists believe that if the supply of money is double, for example, there there would be no impact on the real performance of the economy. All that would happen. Uh, all that would happen is that the price level would, would double. The classical dichotomy, dichotomy. Oh, i shoot, I'm been mis mis uh, pronouncing that as usual. Dichotomy uh, that emerged in the in 19th uh, century stands in contradiction to the earlier ideas de uh, developed by economists such as David Hume that uh, that there is trade off between unemployment and inflation that could be manipulated in, in policy terms by the central bank bearing the money supply, uh, Hume of 1752. It is, if no surprise, the classical employment model relies on, in part on the notion of a dichotomy for its 
conclusion. Its origin origins were based on a barter model in which there is an absence of money and owner producers uh, producers trade real products. Clearly, this concept conception of an economic the economy has no applications in the modern econo economy we live in. Classical monetary theory was only intended to explain the level and change in the general price level. The main attention of the classical economists was in trying to understand the supply of output and the accumulation of productive cap cap uh, capital and hence economy, uh, economic growth. The theory of general price level was, that emerged from classical di dichotomy was called the quantity mo theory of money. Yeah, quantity theory of money, which was outlined in Chapter 11. The theory had its origin in the work of French economists in the uh, French economists in the, in the 16th century, in particular uh, Jean Baudin. Uh, why would we be interested in something a French economist conceived in the 16th century? The answer is that just as the main idea of classical employment theory still re resonates in the public de uh, debate, for example, the denial that mass unemployment is a result of deficiency of aggregate demand, the theory of inflation ha uh, that arises from the quantity of theory of money is still influential indeed and forms the, the core of what, become, what became known as monetarism in the 1970s. As we have learned already from the from this textbook, economics is a con, uh, contested discipline and different schools of thought advance conflicting policy frameworks, monetarism, and is more modern expressions from one such school and, th and thought in macroeconomics and rely on the quantity theory of money for their inflation theory. It, we will also see that the crude theory of inflation that mer emerges from the quantity theory of money has uh, intuitively or intuitive appeal and is not very different to what we might expect the average layperson to believe that growth in money supply causes the value of money to decline. That's causes that is causes inflation. The quantity theory of money was also influential in the 19th century. The theory begins with what was known as the equation of exchange, which is an accounting identity. Uh, we write the equation as, in chapter 17.1, 17, uh, 17 M couple M couple, couple, uh, couple V equals couple PY. You are familiar with the terms on the right-hand side, PY, is the nominal value of total output, which is simply for definition of nominal GDP in the national accounts. Given that P is the price level and Y is the real output, uh, M is the quantity of money uh, in circulation, the money supply, say M2, which was defined in Chapter 10 which is a stock so, so, so many dollars at a point in time. V is called the income the velocity of circulation and is the average number of times the stock of money turns over in the, in the generation of aggregate income. There is no theoretical uh, content in the equation 70.1 as it stands since it is uh, an identity. We must, we thus need to introduce some behavioral elements in order to uh, use the equation 70.1 as a theory of the general uh, general <laughs> general price level 17.1 uh, velocity example to understand velocity we can you we can consider the the following examine uh, example of an imaginary and simple economy assume that the stock of money is 100 which is held by the two people that make up this economy in the current period say a year a person a buys goods and services from person b for 100 in turn person b buys goods and services from person a for 100 the total transaction equals one two hundred dollars yet there's only 100 uh, money uh, was only one money stock in the economy Thus, each dollar must be used twice over the course of a year. So the velocity in the economy is two. 
The velocity of circulation converts the stock of money into a flow of monetary spending and renders the self -hand, left hand side of the equation of 17.1 uh, commensurate with the right hand side. In this regard, it is important to see the quantity theory of money and sales law as being mutually re uh, reinforced planks of the classical theory. Sales law was proposed to justify the presum presumption that full employment output would be continuously supplied and sold, which, mean, which meant that the quantity theory of money would ensure that changes in the stock of, mon of money would only impact on the price level. As Keynes observed, price level changes do not necessarily correlate with changes in the money supply, and this led to this re rejection of the quantity theory of money. Another way of stating this is that the velocity of money need not be fixed, and real output need not tend to the full employment level. In turn, Keynes' understanding of how the price level could change without a change in the money supply was informed by his rejection of Say's law. He recognized that total employment is determined by effective demand and that a capitalist monetary economy could experience a def def deficient effective demand. However, the classical theories considered that a flexible real wage would, when it would, would ensue that full employment is attained, at least at a nominal state where co competition prevails and there are no artificial real wage uh, rigidities imposed. As a result, they consider Y to be fixed at the full employment output level. Additionally, they, con they considered V to be cons constant given that it is determined by customers and payment habits. For example, people are paid on a weekly or, or fortnightly basis and shop, say, once a week for their needs. Equation 17.2 depicts the resulting in causation causality that defines the quality theory of money as an explanation of the general price level. The horizontal bars above the V and the Y indicate that they are assuming to be con constant. It follows the change in M with uh, will directly and only impact on P. To understand the theory more deeply, it is important to note that the classical economist considered the role of money to be confined to acting as a medium of exchange for to free people from the tyranny and necessity uh, of a double coincidence of wants under the barter system. In other words, money would uh, overcome the problem of a farmer who had carrots to offer uh, but wanted some plumbing done and could not find a plumber desiring any carrots, for example. Money is thus seen as the means of lubricating the exchange of goods and services. There is no other reason why a person would wish to hold it under the, this limited conceptual, uh, conception of money. The underlying view is that if individuals found that they had more money than in the past, then they would try to spend it. Logically, it follows that they considered a rising stock of money to be associated with the growth in aggregate demand or spending. As equation 17.2 shows, monetary growth and the assumed extra spending would directly lead to price rises because the economy is already assumed to be producing at its maximum production capacity and the habits underpinning of velocity are stable. Uh, hold on. Anyway. Uh, da -da -da. Numeral uh, aggregate demand. Uh, thus, it is there. Thus, if there is an increase in availability of credit and borrowers use the deposits that are created by the loans to purchase goods and services, firms will ex excess uh, capacity are likely to respond by rising real output to maintain market share rather than rising prices. Second, the empirical behavior of the velocity of circulation dem demonstrates that the assumption that it is constant in, is implausible. 70.1 uses data provided by the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis and shows the velocity of circulation, which is constructed as a ratio of nominal GDP to the M2 measure of the money supply. The Federal Reserve of St. Louis is measures a uh, rate of turnover in the money supply, that is, the number of times $1 is used to purchase 
Final goods and services, including GDP, this is 2016. The evidence does not support the claims of quantitative uh, theory of money. No simple proportionate, uh, proportionate relationship exists between rise in the money supply and rise in general price level. Seventeen point five uh, income policies. Government pol uh, faces a wage price spiral. Have from time to time considered the use of so-called income policies. Uh, if they were reluctant to introduce a sharp contraction in the economy, which might otherwise discipline the combatants in the distributional struggle, income policies in uh. In general, are measures that are measures that are aimed to control the rate in, at which wages and prices rise as the economy as the economy moves forward. Or sorry, towards or or is at full employment. Progressive economists have uh, often advocated that use to rein in cost pressure and avoid the need to reduce overall spending, which creates higher involuntary unemployment. Income policies have been introduced in various forms at various times in a number of countries in a way, uh, as a way of reducing supply-side cost pressures and allowing employment to stay at a higher level. For example, in 1962, the U.S. government introduced wage price uh, guides, uh, guidepost, which allowed for an average rate of nominal wage increase equal to the average annual rate of productivity growth in the overall economy. This means that per unit labor cost of production remains a constant. Uh, cost. Other nom uh, nominal incomes, including profits, were also uh, to be tried to this, tied to this rule. Taken together, it was considered that this rule would stabilize the growth in nominal incomes and directly link real income growth to productive productivity growth, thereby reducing any inflationary pressures associated with the maintenance of full employment. Its complicated applications, excuse me, would thus distribute uh, distribute uh, productivity gains across all income earners and thus reduce the distributional conflict which might otherwise instigate a wage price spiral. However, a problem with the rule is that workers in above average productivity growth sectors are uncompensated un and the workers in below average sectors are overcompensated. Also, workers would be unable to pursue money wage increases in response to profit pushes by firms. For a time, the, guide in, the guidelines seemed to work, but, at, but as U.S. government expenditure grew as a result of the Vietnam War and the unemployment uh, fell below 4%, wage increases began to exceed average productivity growth in Sorry about that. I was literally cut off. My internet fell off. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where I was at. And see, despite the failure of the wage price guidepost, the Republican administration uh, under the Nixon uh, reintroduced uh, an income policy in 1971. Initially, this was the form of a 90-day freeze on wages and other nominal incomes. Uh, later, uh, compulsory growth guidelines were set to wages and the price of growth. In '73, the government introduced yet another freeze on prices, followed by sector-by-sector -sector price rises in line with uh, cost increases with a freeze on profit margins. So workers were exposed to rising prices of oil and food. The experimental and the experiment ended in April of 1974. It was considered a success when it was in place, but when the controls were eliminated, prices and wages began to rise again. Although wage and price pressures come, coming uh, pressures coming from the demand side were subdued, the problem was ongoing pressure from the cost supply side, in particular from energy and food, largely grains. Prices which led to higher price inflation, workers were unable to secure money wage increases 
in line with price inflation, which contributed to the divergence between real wage growth and productivity growth. On the other hand, in the UK and Australia, the institutional structures that made eco economies more acceptable um, to distribution conflict in the late 1960s and 70s also made the operation of income policies difficult. Highly concentrated in industries with large uh, firms exercising significant price setting power were in, uh, interacting with strong trade unions. These firms were a strong position to pass on wage demands in the form of higher prices, and government uh, governments were reluctant or unable to uh, enable constitutionally to mandate strict wage price controls in nominal times. However, income policies have worked more effectively in some European nations, for example, Australia and, and Scandinavian countries. These nations have long uh, records of collective bargaining and, uh, and are more attuned to uh, tribal, uh, wait, tripartite uh, and negotiate, to, 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 okay, uh, negotiate than the English speaking nations. A good example of, of a successful income policy approach where wages and prices growth were driven by productivity growth in central se in certain sections is the so-called Scandinavian model of inflation. The, this approach to wage setting was developed in Sweden and attempted to marry notions of fairness, the effectiveness of centralized wage bargaining and in, international competitiveness. In the late 1970s, income policies mo uh, lost favor in most countries as a result of the rising dominance of mo uh, monetarism which eschewed, eschewed, excuse me, uh, international or uh, uh, institutional, excuse me, solution to distributional conflict in favor of market-based approaches uh, involving higher employment, unemployment. The monetarist uh, approach in many advanced nations combined the use of persistently higher or high employment, unemployment, with a policy designed to reduce the bargaining power of workers. This reduced, this reduced inflationary pressures because workers were unable to pursue real wage growth and as a result, productivity growth outstripped real, wage, real, real wages, uh, wages uh, growth. This led to a substantial uh, uh, yeah, uh, distribution, sub, stand, uh, substantial redistribution of income towards profits during the, this period. The rise of Thatcherism in the UK exemplified the increasing dominance of monetarist, uh, monetarist view in the 1980s. In September 19, we will enter September, Jesus, excuse me, in such chapter, I keep saying September for some reason, chapter 19, we will introduce the concept of employment and unemployment buffer stocks in a macroeconomic economy and analysis, how they can be manipulated by policy to maintain price stability. This is box 17.2. This Scandinavian model, or SM, or I mean of inflation. This model, which was originally devoted for fixed exchange rates, uh, dichotomies, uh, yeah, dichotomies, uh, the economy into a competitive sector uh, or C for C sector and shelter se uh, sector or S so sector. The C sector produces products which are traded on world markets and its pr prices follow the, gener the, the general movements in world prices. The C sector serves as the leader in wage settlements the s sector does not trade its good uh, goods ex externally under fixed exchange rates the c sector maintains price competitiveness if the growth in uh, to be wait i'm sorry uh, growth in money wages there it is uh, in its sector is equal to the rate of changes in its labor productivity assumed to be superior to S sector productivity plus the growth in prices of foreign goods under this condition 
price inflation in the C sector is also and is equal to the foreign inflation rate. The wage norm established in the C sector spills over into wage growth throughout the economy. Let's see. Ah. The C sector uh, inflation rate thus equals the wage norm less its own productivity growth rate. Hence, uh, aggregate price inflation is equal to the world inflation rate plus the differences uh, difference between the productivity growth rate in C and S sectors weighed by the S sector shared in such output. The domestic inflation rate can be higher than the rate of growth in foreign prices without damaging competitiveness as long as the rate of C sector uh, inflation is less than or equal to the world inflation rate. In equilibrium, nominal uh a bore costs, a oh, labor cost, Jesus, cost in the C sector will grow at a, a rate equal to the normal or uh, norm, the sum of the growth in world prices in the C sector productivity, where non uh, where non wage costs are some of the growth in world pro prices, wait, uh, are positive taxes. There we go, social security and other benefits. Uh, extraction from the employers and possibly growing. The requirement is that the per unit variables cost grow at the state or rate of world prices. The long run tendency is for uh, the for nominal wages to absorb the room uh, the room provided. However, in the short run, labor costs can diverge from the permitted growth path. This this disequilibrium must uh, emanate from domestic factors. The main features of the SNM, uh, the SM, I'll just say, can be uh, summarized as follows. One, the domestic currency price of C sector output as exogenously uh, determined by world market prices and exchange rates. The surplus available for distribution between profits, wages, and the C sector is thus determined by the world initial inflation rate. The exchange rate and the product and the productive the productivity performances of industries in the C sector. The wage outcome in the second C sector flows onto the C S sector industries either by design uh, solidarity. Uh, or through comp competition, the price of output in the C and the S sector is determined usually by the mark of by the unit labor cost in that sector. The wage outcome in the C sector and the productivity performances uh, perfor performance in the S sector determines the, ca the change in unit labor cost. An outcome policy would establish wage guidance guidelines, which would set national wages growth according to trends in world prices adjusted for exchange rate changes and productivity in the C sector. Uh, sector. This would help to maintain a stable lo level of profits in the C sector, whether this was an equilibrium level dependent on the distribution of uh, factor share prevailing at the time uh, in, in the time of guidelines were first applied clearly the outcomes could be different from those suggested by the model if it if a short run adjusted and factor shares was required once a normal share of profits were achieved the guidelines could be enforced to maintain the this uh, distribution a major criticism of the SM as a general theory of inflation is that a that it ignores the demand side on uh, un uncoordinated collective bargaining and or significant growth in the non-wage components of labor costs may push costs above the permitted path, where domestic pressures created or create divergence from the equilibrium path of nominal wage and cost there are there is some rational rationale for 
pursuing a con consensus-based e uh, incomes policy by minimizing domestic cost fluctuations based by the exposed sector and incomes the policy could reduce the possibility of a c sector profit squeeze help maintain c sector competitiveness and avoid employment losses significant uh, contrib contributions to the general cost level of hence of hence prices can originate from the actions of government and payroll taxation and various government changes may in fact be more determined uh, detrimental to the exposes uh yeah exposed uh, sorry exposed sector than increased wage demands from the labor market although the sm was originally devoted for or uh, developed by excuse me for fixed exchange rates it can uh, accommodate Flexible, um, wait a minute, uh, price, uh, fle flexible exchange rates. Exchange rate movement can compensate for world price changes and rate of the exchange rate continuously appreciates uh, at a rate equal to the sum of the world inflation rate and C sector pro uh, productivity growth. And similarly, if local price rises occur, a stable domestic uh, inflation rate can still be maintained if a corresponding de de decrease in C sector prices occurs. And appreciation or appreciating exchange rate discounts the foreign price and domestic uh, currency terms. What uh, what about terms of trade changes? Terms of trade changes, which the which is which which in the SM. Justify wage rises also in practice stimulate uh, sympathy sympathetic exchange rate changes. This uh, combination locks the economy into an un uncompetitive bind because of the rel relative fixed fixity uh, of nominal wages, unless the exchange rate depreciates far enough to offset both the price fall and the wage rise prof uh, profiting. Profitability in the C sector it will be squeezed. Policy makers, particularly in Sweden, uh, considered uh, considered it uh, appropriate to uh, emulate 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 whatever <laughs> this problem through income policy. Such a policy could be designed to prevent a, dis a destabilized destabilizing wage movement in response to terms of trade improvements. In other words, wage bargaining, which is a constant with the in, uh, mechanism defined by SM, may be deter uh, de detrimental in, to both the domestic inflation target and the co competitive of the C sector and may need to be supplement supplemented by a formal income policy uh, to restore or retain the, co uh, the consistency. Conclusion, the chat, this chapter is designed to provide an introduction to the concept of inflation, to highlight that it arises due to the conflictual nature of the capitalist system and that ongoing inflation requires that the major combatants, firms, and workers continue to pursue increases in their nominal incomes. The, the initiating conditions for any inflationary process can be conceptualized in terms of cost push and demand pull, but in practice, it is hard to distinguish between them when an outbreak of higher inflation occurs. We review the quantity theory of money, which is based on an identity uh, when behavioral assumption are Assumptions are introduced. The theory applies that a that a simple pro, uh, pro, 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 proportionate there we go relationship exists between increase in the money supply and rises in the general price level. However, no such relationship has been found. So even if it, it, it were possible to control the money supply, there would there would not be a systematic impact on inflation. Income policies were examined, in particular, uh, the Scandinavian model, or S and, I'll just say SM, of inflation. It was noted that they have largely gone out of favor and countries have tended to rely on the use of unemployment as a buffer stock. 
that is to rely on higher unemployment to address an inflation rate which is considered to be high, uh, too high, irrespective, uh, irrespective of the additional deri drivers of the inflationary process. Okay, so let's see. The next one, next chapter for let's see, uh, Friday, um, no, tomorrow really, uh, would be chapter 18, The Phillips Curve and Beyond. Uh, so far, it's been really cool to read this. So far, it's been really cool to actually learn something that I've been wanting to actually learn for quite some time. Uh, and I'm glad to be able to be learning it uh, with you guys on this channel and to be learning the right version or at least the right uh, picture, right lens, whatever you want to call it, but to be able to learn the real version of what today's econo economy is like, how it works, uh, what drives it, and uh, what you can learn from it to either make more money in the future or at least understand what why things are going the way they are. Um, like the differences between uh, wages being stagnant since the 80s, which uh, was in certain areas in, in, in this book so far, but I think it's the combination of that and really self-professing self uh, policies by uh, legislators, presidents, um, the Fed. Uh, those those people at the top uh, who are at the power and who know that they had the power of the purse string um, and to know is that for some reason people still think that interest rates uh, bring down prices when in reality it's they're, they're they're trying to stifle loans but when loans are when there's a demand for spending, and there's not enough, say, wages increases and government spending to put money in our pocket to be able to consume and spend in the economy. Uh, people are going to go for those personal loans. People are going to go for those housing loans, real estate loans, and whatnots uh, to get those things that they could either uh, make, make money on. Or some to that effect. Like it's kind of like um, I look at it. Uh, if you buy buy a house to be able to flip it, you want to buy it at the lowest amount you want you can, lowest in, uh, interest rate on a loan. Uh, but at the same time, you want to be able to take some of the money you've already uh, gotten from the loan and fix up the house to the point where you can where you can sell it beyond what you paid for it. It's the same thing with cars, same thing with pretty much anything that would with time depreciate unless uh, unless uh, taken care of and there's a market for a higher price for those things. Otherwise, it's going to depreciate and you're going to lose money overall. So anyway, uh, thanks again for, uh, for listening. Please subscribe, please comment, please give me a thumbs up uh, or give me a middle finger in the comment section, whatever. Uh, just respond in some way. Uh, let me know that you're watching. Let me know that you either appreciate what I'm saying or you have a counter argument or a counter um, uh, something counter to say as far as what I'm saying in the, in the, in the economy or macroeconomics books that I'm reading. Book, I should say, I'm reading. Um, anyways, uh, thanks for listening and I'll talk to you another time. Peace out for now.